companies are generally sprinting to stay ahead in this revolution, society and government are struggling to keep up with regulation and thinking about how to prepare ourselves for this new wave. Our next speaker is an expert in just that. He's a professor of applied AI at the Utrecht University of Applied Sciences, and he is the lead in European Union's affairs for the AI Net Investment Fund. He has uh, expertise in machine learning, generative AI, and the emergence of artificial sentience. Please help me welcome to the stage Dr. Stefan Leine. Yes, hello everybody. Thank you for this uh, introduction. Does anybody recognize uh, this uh, robot that I have uh, behind me? If you, if you do, you can, you can show your hand. I see one person here up the front, a couple of persons. Not, not many people. Well, that's not surprising because it's a very old robot. This robot was built in the year 7070, so almost or even over 250 years ago. Uh, and this robot, as you might see from this image, can play chess. And it was not just uh, any chess uh, playing robot, it was actually an excellent chess playing robot. He, he won most games. And uh, as you can imagine, at that time, this was a celebrity. Uh, this robot played against uh, Benjamin Franklin, it, it played against emperors and kings. It also played a game against Napoleon Bonaparte, uh, with many spectators present, so we, we know what happened because uh, um, uh, there, were, there were witnesses there. In fact, Napoleon, being a smart man that he is, he actually decided to play a move in chess that's not allowed, just to see the robot's uh, reaction. And what the robot did is it put up the, he, he took the piece that Napoleon moved and it put it back in its original position. Uh, Napoleon, being uh, inventive again, he, he did the same illegal move. And then the robot took the piece and put it beside the board, as though it's uh, no longer uh, in the game. Uh, Napoleon tried a third time, and then the robot, just in one fell swoop, wiped all the pieces of the board and decided that the game uh, was over, uh, to the amusement of the spectators, of course. Then they uh, set up the pieces again, played another game, and Napoleon lost. Um, well, to me, this is, this is really intelligence. Uh, you, you, you might think, or not think, this is artificial intelligence. If you, if you think this is not artificial, uh, you're right. Uh, because as you, might, as you can see, I hope you can see on the right, there's this little cabinet uh, uh, with, which has like magnets and, and strings and there was a very small person that could fit inside this cabinet and that was also very good at playing chess uh, and, and it essentially of course this is the person that, that played the game. It was very uh, in, ingenuous the way this was uh, set up because of course you need to have a candle because there was no light yet. This was a really long time ago and still they had this but this only was found out about 80 years after this robot toured uh, when, when uh, the plans were revealed by the son of uh, von von Kempelen. Um, now, there was another person who played against this robot, and his name was Charles Babbage. And Charles Babbage is the inventor of this machine, the analytical engine, and it's considered by many to be the first computer uh, in the world. It was able to calculate logarithms, or not algorithms, but logarithms, uh, using uh, all these kinds of devices. Now, interestingly, Babbage played against the robot that you just saw, uh, he also lost in 18 turns, but I like to imagine that Babbage must have been thinking, how does this robot work? What's going on on the inside? Of course, he didn't know there was a person inside. Uh, so what kind of uh, system is responsible for, uh, for, for, for playing chess? And, and of course, this machine was not able to play chess, but it did uh, create the blueprint for the computer, as we know nowadays. And uh, as, as some of you may know, this computer actually beat the world champion in chess, Gary Kasparov, in 1997. So you could say in this 200, 250 year story, it's a nice, a nice uh, story arc, because eventually uh, we do have AI that can play chess and win chess, which was the original uh, uh, point of the, uh, the chess playing robot. Uh, so we're done. We're actually done with AI. We have AI now. The future is here. Uh, but at the same time, as, as also, as you know, and of course this is the topic of today, we're not done at all, uh, because now we have this AI and we don't know how to use it, and we don't know how to develop it further. Uh, there's this nice uh, example, I think, from uh, Netflix, the streaming company, uh, where they collect a lot of data, 
they, uh, they also categorize viewers based on some aspects. So uh, I guess they have like your age and the, uh, male, female, your postal code, maybe your income. They know things about you. That's their, that's their job. And then based on those categories, they try to predict with machine learning uh, what type of series and movies you like to watch. And this is, this is essentially their business model, part of their business model. Now, uh, not very long ago, I would say about, well, 10 years ago, so I guess in AI very long ago, uh, they said, um, they asked the following question, how do we know that the categories that we designed with our uh, limited capacity as humans, how do we know those are the best predictors for your uh, viewing preferences? So, of course, we or, uh, categorize people according to those labels, but those might not be the best labels. So let's reverse uh, engineer this machine learning algorithm. And now that we have all this data, let's decide what categories are the best predictors for your viewership. Is my mic still on? Yeah. And they did that. And so they came up with uh, 50 dimensions or 50 labels that you could, uh, could attach to a viewer, all generated by the computer, by AI. And about 20 of them made a lot of sense. So you would see uh, men here, female here, you would see an age distribution, and there was very clear preferences in viewership. Of course, not completely uniform, but you could identify the categories and you could attach a label to them. Now, for 30 of those 50 categories, I think I, I'm getting a new uh, mic, for 30... You would see uh, uh, people on the left side, people on the right side. And on the left side, they had a strong preference for the movie American Beauty. And on the left side, they had a strong preference for X on the Beach. And nobody had any clue what discerned the group on the left from the group of the right. So that means that there was essentially a quality in, in those groups of people that we don't have a word for. We don't know how to, to understand that, um, which for Netflix was great because it means they had now 30 more predictors they could use to go do good predictions. But on the other hand, it's a huge problem. Because now if you want to change something in those labels or you want to change something in the way that you use the model, you no longer understand what you're dealing with. And this is essentially the, the topic of, of, of what I uh, uh, am talking about uh, today. How do you manage? How do you manage innovation and, and, and also through regulation? How do you manage something you can't uh, comprehend? Because essentially that's what uh, AI is. And this is not just a problem for companies uh, implementing in AI. I mean, we all know plenty of examples of AI going wrong. And when it goes wrong, it tends to go wrong quite deeply. Like in this case, if you ask AI to provide you with an image of a salmon, the AI is not wrong. I mean, this is uh, 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 statistically the most likely image of a salmon you, you will find on the internet, apparently. Uh, but of course, we know that this is not what uh, was expected. And this is not just something, uh, uh, this is not just a bug. It's essentially a feature of AI that it's so complicated. So uh, I, I, I teach uh, AI, I teach uh, students how to program AI systems and machine learning systems. If I ask any of my students to come up with a program, not using machine learning or AI, but a, a program that filters out the dogs from the cakes in, this, in these kind of images. It will be very difficult because you can count the, the dots, but in most cases there are three black dots. You can look at the color patterns, but they're also similarly, uh, they're also alike. Uh, there's, there seems to be some, some kind of round uh, uh, image there. So it's very hard to come up with a rule set that we understand that discerns A from B. And at the same time, we know that for AI, for machine learning, this is a very easy task. This is not difficult at all. And that's because the AI essentially programs itself. Or in other words, AI come up with, can come up with a model that is so complex that we don't understand how it works anymore, but it still produces the outcome that we're looking for. In this case, a category a classifier. Um, and that's great because those very complex models allow us to build systems of essentially infinite complexity. There's no, no boundary to the complexity of the model just the data that you use, the computing power that you use, uh, the, the fitness function that you use, but, but those things we can collect. Um, but it's also terrible because it means that the complexity of the model, uh, we don't know how to, to, to deal with this complexity anymore. It's beyond our, our human comprehension. Uh, now, about uh, 12, 13 years ago, I was in Mountain View at Google. They had a self-driving car division. I think it later spun off at, uh, as, as, as Waymo. 
um, and they had the head of their self-driving car division explain the following problem to us. He said, uh, we have to deal with all kinds of technical challenges. But he asked the audience, what do you think our most difficult challenge is to overcome? Now, this was a room full of engineers. So they said, well, um, the steering or, or locating yourself on the street, uh, or, or, or uh, huh? uh, how, how do I uh, do image segmentation? He said, no, you're all wrong. Those are all technical problems that can be solved. There's a much deeper underlying problem here. And that's the problem of when do I brake? So there's something, eh, the camera spots something of your, of your self-driving car coming alongside. Let's say there's a 99% chance that it is just a leaf blowing by. And it's a 1% chance that it's a child crossing the street. Do you break? Well, of course, you would, you would break in a 1% chance. But now we lower the chance to 0.1 or 0.0.1. At what point do you decide to break? Well, the point, of course, is we never make that decision as humans. But when you program a system like that, you have to make a decision because it's rule-based. So you have to say, if the probability is below this and that, then I break. So it becomes an ethical problem. And these kind of ethical problems are much more difficult to solve than technological problems. Because who's going to answer that? Who's going to give you this number? It's not the programmer. The programmer will go to the manager or to the CEO, and they will go to the legal division or to the insurer or to the legislator. And nobody's willing to provide an answer. For moral reasons, or also for, for insurance reasons, it's very difficult to solve this problem, he said. Now, of course, nowadays, uh, they have a different approach. They just gather the data, and they say, based on this data, this is the probability of, uh, of breaking that, uh, that humans have. And so uh, they, they sort of uh, 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 moved the uh, uh, ethical challenge uh, uh, under the rug, under the carpet. But it's still there. So don't, don't get fooled by those uh, strategies. Uh, and, and, and so the examples I showed, uh, so Netflix, Google, those are tech companies. But you see it everywhere, of course. We also know that AI is going to uh, play a major role in healthcare in, in, the, in the future, not just in medicine, but also in caring for the elderly, for monitoring, for prevention, etc. Uh, at the same time, this, this raises lots of ethical questions. Uh, uh, is this desirable? Here we see uh, a woman uh, who, who, who needs care. Uh, there's no care for her. This is from the documentary uh, I, I Am Alice. And there's this robot a companion taking care of her, mental care. Is this what we want or is this not what we want? Again, it's not a technical question, it's a moral question. And, and, and as you know, in the last 10, 15 years and in the foreseeable future, AI has moved from the lab to society. So that means that uh, 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 JetGTP uh, already is adopted, I think, even at, at a much higher rate than most companies know about their, uh, their employees. So here in this uh, statistic, you see that uh, a large percentage of employees use JetGTP. Uh, uh, um, but if you ask the CEOs of those companies, they probably mention a lower number because many, companies, many employees use their, these kind of tools without the company knowing it. Uh, we know that a majority of jobs, this is a report by Google from the last month, majority of jobs in the Netherlands will be affected by AI, either by full of partial displacement or AI complementing uh, their work. And we also know there are enormous opportunities in terms of GDP and automation, producing different qualities of work, coming from generative AI. So on the one hand, it's, a, it's a, a very difficult to manage technology, fundamentally, not just as a bug, but really like intrinsically difficult. On the other hand, it provides enormous promises for, for problems that we don't know how to solve uh, elsewhere and produ produces enormous uh, efficiency gains. So it would be wise to take a step back and to think more deeply and also more long-term about the effects of this technology before we start thinking about how do we innovate in the long-term and how do we regulate technology, because regulation is also a very slow-moving, uh, long-term process. What helps us is uh, looking back a little bit. So uh, there are other systems technologies like AI. So we have the computer, we have the internet, we have the steam engine and electricity. And if you think about the steam engine, uh, when it was first discovered, nobody could have a clue of the implications of this technology 10, 20, or 30 years down the line. The first steam engines that you see here in this, in this uh, drawing, they were used to uh, automate uh, factories. So instead of uh, people working on benches uh, close to each other so they could talk, now, now the whole workforce was essentially designed along the axis of this uh, steam engine. So everything would be mechanically uh, automated much more um, easily, much more efficient. It meant a lot of changes to the workforce, of course. It also meant that work could go on 
uh, hour after hour also in the evenings and in the weekends because uh, now, it's, it, it, I mean, you have this machine, you want to keep using it. I guess it's a, a bit the same for ASML nowadays. It's a very expensive machine, so you want to make sure it runs all the time. Uh, but in the case of the uh, steam engine, that led to a lot of societal changes. So you had uh, labor forces, uh, you had unions, you had uh, new ideologies popping up. The steam engine also came a lot smaller. There was commodification. So at some point, they put it into an engine. You got the steam engine on a rails, uh, railways. Uh, well, railways meant completely different ways of warfare, economy, diplomacy. Uh, the world got a lot, a lot smaller. This all happened in a time span of several decades. But we will see similar effects that are completely unpredictable for AI also rolling out over the next couple of decades. So it's good to be aware of those. And also, most of these effects of the steam engine were not technological. They were societal, economical, sometimes political. So it's also good to be aware of this when it comes to uh, AI. Um, a second element of AI is the speed at which it develops. And we've all been witness to this. I mean, I've been giving talks about uh, artificial creativity. Uh, for, uh, for about uh, 10 years now, and 10, 8 years ago, it was very easy for me to create a talk. I could just show people this image, and, they, and then I would say, this cat does not exist, and people would be taken aback. Like, this was, this was the, the uh, highlight of my presentation. Now I show you this image, I see your faces, I see nobody even raising an eyebrow. And then, two years later, I had to show this image. Again, I see no reaction from you. I don't expect any reaction, by the way. But So, three years ago, we had uh, reality, and uh, now, I guess, this year, we have a moving image. Also, nobody is, is batting an eye. So, this is not interesting anymore, which is, which is fine, but it shows just how fast it goes, and how, how, how quickly we adopt and get used to these kind of uh, 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 tools. And it also raises a question, this is just a time span of eight years from, from left to right. So what, where are we in 25 years from now? Like, this, this won't continue in, in one direction. I mean, you can't get more realistic than, than you can get here, or at least not much, at least, I think. Uh, but you can, uh, uh, of course, apply AI in completely new different fields, similar as, as was done with the uh, steam engine. So, uh, you know, uh, creating new materials, uh, com coming up with new inventions, uh, new, new types of uh, engineering. Uh, we already know that AI has a major role to play in uh, creativity and in, uh, in coding. Um, um, we also know that the AI that we know now is, is, is very uh, primitive. We'll look back 10 years from now. I'll, I'll be giving this, I'll, I promise you, I'll be giving a, another speech to you in 10 years. And you won't be taking it back by anything I tell you now because you'll say, ah, this has all been done before. Because what we see now in AI is, is a very old interface. It's essentially, uh, yeah, chat GTP is the interface of the internet of the previous system technology. And that's always been the case. When the first car was invented, it was a horseless carriage. When the first TV was invented, it was essentially radio programming with, uh, with an image uh, glued on top of it. And now what we have with AI is, is an internet browser with an AI model behind it. And, uh, if, and for most of you who've been following the news, you already see that the interfaces are, are developing very rapidly. So you'll get voice interfaces, you get a lot more personalization with AI. This is also a trend that's very, uh, very apparent. So then, so we, so we talked a bit about the history, we talked a bit about uh, the, the pace at this, at, at this the things develop, about uh, the complexity being a feature, not a bug. Uh, we can also dive a little bit more into the, uh, the technology itself. So this is uh, a, a, a graph I, uh, I, I designed about uh, five years ago with a student of mine. It's called Neural, Neural Network Zoo, and what you see is from the uh, top left all the way to the bottom right is the evolution of neural network architectures. Now, interestingly, at the bottom right, uh, this, this is called the transformer architecture. Essentially, the evolution stopped. So most AI that you hear about now, nowadays, most AI developed at Microsoft and Google and OpenAI and others, are based on this transformer architecture. So this was this Cambrian explosion of architectures, and then suddenly it converged. Uh, then you had, uh, and this is from the last five years or so, then you had all these models that were sort of exploding, model names. They're also converging. Nowadays, we talk about uh, OpenAI's GPT, we talk about uh, Gemini, uh, we talk about Llama, uh, Mistral maybe, but there are not that many models even. So not just the technology has been locking in, but the models themselves as well. So you see a huge conversions into only a very limited set of players and, and models. And this is, of course, due to the scaling that uh, uh, also this morning has, huh? so you're very aware of this. The scaling law, so it becomes very difficult to, uh, to play in this game. Uh, but 
it's, it's, it's a bit of a, um, uh, it's, I think it's very interesting that on the one hand you have a convergence to a limited set of models in a limited set of, um, of companies, and on the other hand you have this emergence of new functionalities coming out of these, these large scale models. So they, they surprise us all the time, but they're only a very limited set of models that are able to surprise us. And, and these things, these developments, these trends, all uh, uh, inform the way that we regulate this technology. And the speaker after me will talk to you a bit more about governing AI within this regulatory framework. But this is currently how the European Union thinks about regulating uh, this technology. So essentially, you have four categories. Uh, there is a minimal risk category where there's not much or hardly any legislation. There's a limited risk for chatbots, for example. So if uh, I interact with a chatbot, I have to know I'm interacting with a chatbot and not a human, so the AI has to be transparent. Then there's a high risk category where there will be all kinds of uh, 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 ethical checks uh, around, uh, uh, um, uh, let's say, toys or, or healthcare or anything that has a, a, a real risk for consumers or, or, or citizens or society has to comply with this, uh, this ethical check. And then finally, we have a so called uh, category of unacceptable risk which is uh, uh, systems, AI systems, that can subconsciously uh, influence you, or uh, uh, social scoring networks, uh, those will all be forbidden under this new uh, legislation. Um, I don't think I'll go into this, uh, but I'm happy to talk about this in the panel or, or afterwards, because this is a bit too, uh, um, too much. Let's see. Just go a little bit over this. I think I'll just move to my final slide and then I'll open for questions, but you saw maybe some slides, be happy to answer questions about this. I wanna end with this final uh, note because I think this is essentially where we are right now. The real problem of humanity is the following. We have paleolithic emotions, medieval institutions, and, and with AI, godlike technology. So this, this, I think this raises a lot of more questions than, than it does uh, answers, but again, happy to talk to you uh, at any point. So thank you.